Hi, uh, I'm John Lisney. I am EU Lead and Research Analyst for the Social Progress Imperative. And joining us today is Michael O'Flaherty, uh, who is the Director of the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, Michael, if I may, uh, would you like to maybe start by saying a few, a few words about yourself and about the agency that you lead and the work you do to advance human rights in the EU? Thanks, John. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, yeah, I, I'm at the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, which is the body with responsibility to support the EU, its member states and its institutions to respect human rights in their work. Uh, at least in their work, meaning when they're working on issues of, uh, that are the business of the EU. We focus within the geography of the member states. We're purely advisory. Uh, and so we're only as good as the advice we offer. And our advice is very strongly evidence-based. Uh, we're, we're, we're in a constant exercise of gathering human rights sensitive data across the 20 member, 27 member states to support uh, law and policy on all of the hot issues. So we're working on migration, we're working on artificial intelligence, we're working in support of the Roma, uh, of uh, minorities, in particular migrant minorities into Europe. Uh, we're working on issues of social justice. Um, we, we're trying to make sure that human rights is at the heart of some of the great big policy developments of the union. The different strategies being developed right now, the upcoming conference on the future of Europe uh, and so forth. We're all based in Vienna, we're about 140 people, so uh, a huge task, small operation. Great, thank you for that. Uh, the topic for today is civic space and youth rights. Uh, what would you say are the main barriers and challenges that young people and youth organizations in particular uh, face in Europe in terms of their capacity to mobilize and ensure that their rights are upheld? I'll start by saying that your own report that's just come out captures in essence some of the core answers to your question. But that said, let me take a few different layers of response. Uh, in the first place, uh, youth movements, youth organizations form part of general civil society. And we've known for years that civil society is under pressure. The way the pressure shows is different from country to country. Its intensity is different from country to country. Uh, but if we were to find four characteristic pressure points, they would be in the first place, uh, financial pressure, lack of access to resources, uh, taxation systems uh, that uh, can undermine, um, lack of access to foreign funding, many other things of that nature. Second, regulatory pressure. Um, an excessive regulation of the operation of civil society, uh, how you can set up your organization, how many members you can have, uh, what the rule book of your organization is, how you report back to the state, uh, rules about your meetings and on and on it goes. These can be very burdensome in some places. Um, third as pressure point has to do with access to the decision and the policy makers. You can have the best ideas in the world, but if you can't communicate them to the people who make the decisions, then you really are uh, limited in your ability to influence. And fourth and finally, and fortunately, rarely, we have direct threat and intimidation and harassment for individuals, for organization and for property. So those four, all at different levels, different intensity, very much different country situations. Um, one interesting dimension of the, um, the variety of representations is how, depending on, on what you work on, you may or may not face heightened pressure. So if you work, for example, on LGBTI issues in some European countries, you're going to find it much harder than if you were working on some other more, let's call them, not the right word, but more mainstream uh, uh, types of activity or issue. Now, all of this got far worse with COVID. Uh, 2020 was a year of heightened risk and pressure to civil society. And by the way, that's not a theoretical statement. We know that from our ongoing conversation with the many hundreds of civil society groups that we deal with. Uh, we saw, for example, um, uh, excessive limits on assembly and association. Uh, uh, it's legitimate to limit certain human rights in fighting the pandemic, but the limits have to be necessary and they have to be proportionate. They have not always been necessary and proportionate. We've also seen a drying up of money for many organizations, uh, and we've seen even less access than previously to the policymakers. With physical meetings disappearing, uh, with the online space getting overcrowded, 
uh, or maybe with a, 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 um, an overlooking of certain consultation steps that you might otherwise have had, there's been even less access than would otherwise have been the case. So 2020, a particularly tough year for civil society in general, but also for young people's groups. Last thing I'll say, uh, I travel around Europe as much as I can, and certainly before the COVID, the pandemic, and I listen as much as I can, and I keep hearing from young people's organizations right across Europe that they have great ideas, they want to engage, they want to participate in shaping the future, they don't get the chances. So in other words, if you're in a young person's organization, you've got even less chance than the rest of COVID society to be allowed to play your part in the necessary uh, debates. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, one of the findings of the Youth Progress Index report is also that there's a clear lack of data collected on this issue of restrictions on civic space. Uh, what are your thoughts on this and what can be done to address this issue? I saw this finding, uh, to be honest, I met it with some surprise uh, because um, I, I would argue that we actually have plenty of data. Uh, maybe we don't know it and use it enough. Uh, my own agency now for a number of years has been following the situation closely, a couple of major reports on threats to European civil society uh, uh, based on engaging with civil society right across the EU. And we do an annual update with the 800 organizations that participate in our civil society space, what we call the fundamental rights platform. Um, side by side with our work, uh, just staying in the EU, you have the now uh, annual rule of law reports produced by the commission, which uh, will increasingly include attention to the uh, situation of civil society within each of the member states. And these are just two of a number of initiatives, both in the public and in the more, um, not private sector, but more in the non-governmental sector. Um, what I would concede is that maybe they're, they're not well enough known. Uh, our own reports are rel still relatively new and maybe there isn't enough pickup yet. And that's a challenge to us uh, to, to get them out there uh, uh, so that they can better inform the debates. And what I would also concede is that while I think we're doing a reasonably good job of data collection, we should also look at what other instruments to add to our toolbox uh, in the same context. Um, it's not, I think, an EU competency, not something the EU could appropriately do, but somebody that's, that has the capacity and the mandate and the resources should look at developing an EU observatory uh, with regard to threats against civil society so that they're captured in real time and can be responded to in real time. That would be a very useful service, uh, which are, I've been calling for it now for a couple of years. Uh, and maybe there is uh, there's some organization listening to us today that might like to further explore this. Uh, and I speak about civil society writ large, but this point is no less valid when we focus on the, uh, the youth sector. I'll definitely be looking into that. Um, the report also finds a strong relationship at national level between um, civic space restrictions and youth progress, meaning that there the more restrictions there are on civil society, the less young people are able to advance their social causes. So what role do you see for the European Union in terms of supporting young people and youth organizations in this regard? Well, first, I think the finding is completely unsurprising. I would have been surprised by any other finding. Uh, a, a thriving civil society, including its, 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 its youth component, is one of the, the legs of the stool uh, that is a democracy. So if you pull away or you damage that leg, the whole stool crumbles. Uh, so that doesn't surprise me in the least. We need a strong, vibrant, rich, engaged, challenging, difficult, stimulating civil society in, with a youth voice loud at its heart in order to propel our societies into the future. But those conversations may not always be easy, but they are necessary. Um, in that spirit, I welcome a few initiatives that I see right now in 2021. Most famously, uh, there's the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, it is giving a privileged space to young people's voices. Let's make sure that that's taken full advantage of. Uh, let's use the Conference on the Future of, Euro of Europe to get a sense of where Europe's young people want Europe to go. Not just for their own future, but for now. I don't like this, say, re people often say, involve young people because it's their future. Yeah, great, fine, I get that. But I want to involve young people also for my future. 
uh, uh, for now, not just for the future. Uh, and I think in the conference context, uh, we can pull that off. Uh, another among many current initiatives is the uh, Fundamental Rights Forum that my own agency organizes every three years. It will take place 11 and 12 October uh, of this year. It will be hybrid, a bit in Vienna, but much of it online, multiple hubs across Europe. And we're working very hard to make sure that young people's voices are heard loud and clear uh, through uh, the forum discussion and reflected then in its outcomes, which are about coming up with smart solutions for tough human rights problems. Um, all of this work, by the way, is based on a recognition in the uh, Lisbon Treaty uh, of, uh, uh, of the distinctive role of young people. So, you know, it, it, it's rare to see young people, children sometimes, yes, in treaties, but not often young people. It's rare to see young people given a privileged, prioritized visibility in the foundational instrument of something like the European Union. Uh, let's, 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 let's make it our goal in the next few years to bring those words to life in terms of societies that, that, that cherish young people uh, and uh, within which young people thrive, including in the leadership of all of us. I'm sure that's a message that the European Youth Forum, uh, who are the leads on this project, will be welcoming with open arms. Um, Michael O'Flaherty, thank you so much for taking the time today um, to discuss this very important topic and for your participation in this event. So, John, my, my, John, my thanks to you. And again, good luck with the event and well done on all the great work.